All right, this is a uh, course we were by Schwartz, uh, host from the FLA Chronicles. Welcoming today um, Guru Mark Wiley, author and uh, screamador extraordinaire. How do you do, uh, Guru Mark? I'm doing great, Mike. Thank you. Excellent, excellent. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit today. Uh, first of all, uh, by starting out with a little bit about your history of yourself and uh, in particular, what drew you into uh, the martial arts in general? Um, what got me into martial arts? Uh, getting picked on as a kid. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, being shorter. Um, even now I'm only 5'6", you know. Um, and, and height and um, so got picked on and beat up in the Cub Scouts and um, my mother was kind enough to enroll me in the fourth grade in the Taekwondo school um, that started me off and then wrestling at the YMCA uh, and then just from there it went on to um, training around the world and, and um, through the taekwondo and through the wrestling, were you a tournament competitor, and uh, were you uh, someone with some influence at that time? Uh, um, no influence really. I did train for the Junior Olympics when they first came out, and uh, I was not able to make that. Um, I did compete in, in a number of open, you know, open tournaments and won some trophies, like everyone else in those. Um, received my first don, I guess. Um, 1982, I think, mm -hmm. um, in that style of, uh, from the WTF, and I've gone, gone through all the, the school, you know, the different schools with the different Korean teachers out here changed from the ITF to the WTF, and um, the different forms, the Palge and the Taekook and the Wanjo forms, and uh, we had to keep changing those and rewriting them. I'm very yeah. familiar with that as well. My background is actually uh, started with uh, the Mudokwon, uh, yes. uh, Taekwondo, Hapkido, and, uh, and Judo. And right. So I'm very familiar with switching. And we were. I was Munmukwan uh -huh. and and Hapkido, <laughs> uh -huh. and then uh, and then we also got uh, Kuksul, came in a little bit later, uh, and then Olympic, you know, regular, uh, traditional Taekwondo into Olympic style, with the shorter stances and the arc kicks and the chest protectors and headsets all came out, you know, for the end, and, and I just jumped out and jumped into our niece and Screamont and Wing Chun and all kinds of things in the, in the mid-80s, and, um... What came after the Taekwondo? Was it our niece? All, at the same time, it was, um, Modern our niece with Remy Presas, and one of his, uh, top students out here on the East Coast named Joe Bridenstine, and I was doing, um, going away to summer camps for Kali, JKD, you know, type type things. Danny Nassano, Paul Brunac, uh, Graciela Casillas, Tim Tackett, you know, the whole the whole group there. Sure. Uh, Francis Fong. Did that for about six years of kind of seminar seminar training, private training, um, and got um, you know Serrata, Modern Ernest. I don't know what else there, um, and then got full time into Serrata. At, uh, concurrently, there. Um, let's see. I guess in the in the. I guess all this kind of happened at around 84, 85, and then I just full time training was like my whole life, <laughs> like all of us, right? When we, you get a bit of the the, the Kool Aid and you can't stop drinking it. Um, and then I was fortunate to have two teachers who lived here. I'm, I'm in Philadelphia, and who Filipino masters who retired here. One from. Pampanga, uh, Onofre Escorpizo is a Cinco Terro master, and um, I studied with him for a few years before he passed away, and Herminio Binias uh, from Negros Occidental, and um, I was with him for about seven or eight years before he passed away. Old old traditional Espadi Daga, long sword and dagger, uh, double sticks, disarming, locking control, and um, so in addition to my, my training with Angel concurrently. Mm -hmm. wow. Now you spent uh, immediately out of Taekwondo. You said that uh, if I could go back, well, you, you had mentioned that you had uh, spent time within our niece, uh, Kali Jeet Kune Do, and Screamin, yeah. and that was all kind of concurrent. Was there one particular instructor within that group, or within that group of artists that was perhaps more influential, more influential upon your development uh, than the yeah. other, and led you in a particular direction? Um. Definitely, I would say that um, 
I had a Wing Chun teacher back then. I was both in the William Chung lineage of Yip Man's art and also the Moyat lineage almost at the same time. Uh, there was two teachers here, um, and the Moyat teacher, who's now the he- who now I think is the head of Moyat's branch after Moyat passed away. His name is Pete Pajio. Um, he had an influence on me, even though my time with him was only uh, a year or so, a year or two, um, because he brought a, a, a lot of Zen and different philosophy into the training. And, and I was teaching Eskrima a little bit at the time, and um, I started, I guess, not even more, more than a little bit, I guess full-time, because I had written an article, some articles for Black Belt Magazine. The first two were about Angel Kabbalist in 1990, 91. And then I did a Wing Chun article for Black Belt back then, and Pete and I was compl- complaining to my Wing Chun teacher at the time, Pete, and saying, um, you know, how disappointed I was my students weren't training hard enough and they can't make time for class and all these things. And he just said, uh, Why are you worried about them? Their kung fu is not your kung fu. You know, you make time for your kung fu. They don't make time for their kung fu. Your development is not their development. So why does it bother you? just be a guide and, and teach to the best of your ability and promote the way that you want to promote and for the ones who who want to follow that 100% they will do that and the ones that are happy with 20% are still happy with 20% and that's their their martial art life mm-hmm. and um, don't impose my own on them and just that idea of not trying to force everyone to be as um, over the top and not crazy about martial arts like I was or it's still am uh, that it was okay to just come to class twice a week or once a week or now and then and we're trained for a hobby or to like the cultural aspect more than the, the combative aspect and mm-hmm. that was a good lesson learned early on did you uh, did you spend uh, back to the uh, back to the Arnis and the Filipino systems yeah uh, did you spend more time with Remy Prasos than any other instructor? Um, no, no. Um, well, uh, no, not not nearly. In regards I mean, to I, seminar and so forth. I I probably did ten seminars with Remy and two or two or three summer camps, and maybe three or four private private training sessions, and then we just kind of hung out when he was around, because I was I was really kind of um, aligned with Angel so strongly that um, I, I preferred the Serato over the modern Ernie. So my, my interest in that, um, you know, all the different Arnie styles, they, they have the same techniques basically, right? Inside, okay. outside, block, cross, block, whatever. But it's the, it's the, um, uh, the method behind it, the style, the, the mechanics, the flavor, you know? Mm-hmm. And do you like chicken marsala or do you like chicken parmesan? It's all chicken, right? right. But, but um, the, the flavor is different, and I like I prefer the flavor of Serrata, and I preferred um, my relationship with Angel. Mine with Remy was very good, um, but we were more like uh, he was an older brother rather than a a teacher to me. Although he was a teacher in the beginning, you know. So were you studying um, modern Arnis and and Serrata Escrima at the same time then? Is that yeah, I was overlapping with everything. So modern Arnis started probably a year before a year or two before Serrata because it was local here and Serrata wasn't. Mm -hmm. There was no Serrata on the East Coast. It was like West Coast, Chicago, I think that was it. So, um... And what was your first exposure to Serrata? Um, my first introduction was through a a gentleman named Alan McLucky, who was a student of of Mikey and I, um, and who had also trained with Jimmy Tacosa, and he had done some seminars with Angel, I think maybe even some private training. And um, he was teaching at the Dagerberg Academy in Chicago, and um, and I had met Al out there when I went out to see um, Angel's first seminar in Chicago, uh, and um, and then I started training with with Al. I trained with Mikey and I actually um, a year or two before I actually maybe a year before I, I started training privately with Angel. Also, uh, I took some seminars with Mike's and. Um, did some private time with him, and um, I was just fortunate that Angel. I, I was. I feel fortunate that Angel actually invited me into his art, into his life, took me under his wing, um, 
And it you were a private student of angels. I was a private student of angels, and uh, and I would train also in his academy. And the training brothers of mine at the time, who were, um, you know, uh, there during my tr during my training and during my when I did my master's testing at the academy, were uh, Darren Tibone and uh, Jerry Preciado and Frank Williamas. Um, um, I think who else was around a lot then. Um, those were the three main guys who were there in class when I was there training as well, and I did a lot of training in Angel's living room. <laughs> uh, it's funny I, I'm connected with his children on, you know, and his ex, his, his widow on Facebook, and there his daughter was in diapers and when I was training, and now she's like, I remember when you were there, and, and she's a, a mother now, so it's time flies. Is that Mary Jell? Mary Jell, yeah, uh -huh, uh -huh. yep, Mary Jell. And I have pictures of Jelmar and his uh, his angel son, Jelmar, in his diapers holding my sticks running around the living room, you know. And I look at the old video footage of some of my private training back then, and it's like, wow, did, did I really look like that? <laughs> sure, know? well, I, 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 I can share some of that. Uh, well, I, I, I understand some of that to an extent because, of course, uh, my uh, my initial influence and primary uh, influence uh, from uh, many years ago in Serato Screamer was Chuck Cadell. And oh, Chuck, so, sure. Yeah, and so Chuck, of course, has shown me pictures, and I've got pictures of him on, uh, on my blog and so forth, when he was in the living room and little gel mark was sitting with uh, right, right. <laughs> with uh, Grandmaster Angel at that time, and you could, you know, of course, Chuck had his nice curly fro going. Right, right. <laughs> I, Chuck and I met in Chicago at one of... Uh, you know, one of Angel's seminars, uh -huh. and uh, we, 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 you know, we befriended each other then, uh, back in the 80s, and um, yeah, he had that fro, you know. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I used to have hair, not the, not as much as him, but now, boy, it's gone, you know. Right. Well, that was the, that was the 80s. <laughs> that was the 80s, yeah. I, uh, yeah, so, you know, and of the other Filipinos, you had asked me about inspiration yeah. and, and so forth. You know, I have to tell you that really one of my biggest inspirations and this would be a probably a shock to some people in the Filipino arts is Dan Inosanto of course you would say why not but um, most people don't kind of don't associate me and Dan um, I, uh, I I'm a huge admirer of his and um, I was able to train with him in some seminars and have you know share some meals with him after seminars in the 80s and um, uh, and it attended a two-week summer camp, but since then till now we haven't really communicated, and um, I haven't been able to interview him to include him more in my projects. Uh, although I'm friends with his daughter Diana and her husband Ron Balicki, and I go back as classmates. You know, back before before Ron was an apprentice under Dan, Ron and I were both teaching at the Dagerberg Academy in Chicago, mm -hmm. and Ron was learning learning his Kali, and I was doing Serata whatever so we go back a long way but for whatever reason um, you know I don't have that direct access with Dan that I have with all the other Filipino masters and grandmasters in the Philippines and here in the US and it's kind of kind of a a sad place for me like I, I, I would really love just to sit down and, and chat with him for a few hours just impersonally off the record and uh, and just ask so many questions and get some clarification on some things for my personal interests and but uh, he's got, you know, his students and so forth are really protect him. <laughs> so, you know, then they get mad when they say, well, how come you don't include Dan in your book? Well, he's got to say yes, you know. Uh, so, exactly. but uh, he was a huge influence on me back back in the beginning of my of my training, and I still admire him now. Uh, Angel Cabalas was a huge, very big influence on me. Little man, skinny, what a fighting spirit did he have? Wow, my goodness. And he was he was um, so meticulous in his teaching, uh, especially with me. I, I'm not sure how he was with other people outside of the class, which is kind of informal, you know. But in the private training, I'm sure Chuck can corroborate, and Anthony Davis and other people who train with him privately, that it was down to the detail of the minutia of the movement. It was, I remembered learning inside block against angle six. Mm -hmm. And him having me do the repetition for an hour and a half while he fed me angle six for an hour and a half in slow motion until I got the timing and the positioning exactly 100% perfect and I could repeat it 
again and again and again without messing it up. And it was like an hour and a half of angle six. I don't even want to give angle six for an hour and a half, <laughs> let alone watch somebody else's baddest scream while I'm doing it, right? Sure. But he's just like, I want you to be perfect. He, and he used to tell me, anybody can play piano fast, but if you have to play it slow to hit the note for the correct amount of speed without slurring it, and your technique will be perfect. And it was like, huh, over and over and over. And he said, if you can do it slow, where you're not speeding up to be faster than me, but we're both moving slow. And if you can get the, the cadence right, and he didn't say cadence, but basically that's what he means. Sure. You know, um, then when you do it fast, it's already perfect. You don't get slipped up. And to this day, I haven't met too many people who can do the the inside block against angle six, Serrata style, you know, uh -huh. in the correct tight way without making it look like you're doing it against the number one. Right. You know, which is what Angel didn't didn't want me to do. I don't know what he wanted for other people. So, you know, that kind of detail and the punch block on angle nine, turn the wrist first and then drop down on the knee. Don't drop, don't turn the hand while you're dropping because then the timing is off and your shin can get, get hit and all these details that I see a lot of um, people not putting in place. Either they didn't get it or they forgot or he didn't spend the time or he taught them differently. Who knows, you know. Right. But that kind of attention to detail stuck with me till this day. So, my studies in anatomy and physiology and, and so forth um, later in life, you know, through my doctorates is informed all of that and using Angel's lesson as kind of a jumping off point for for integrating that kind of more technical information into the art. What brought you to the, um, what, what brought you into the writing portion of your career? What was yeah. Signifying moment that made you yeah. say, "I want to write about martial arts," or "I want to uh, yeah. acknowledge these, this individual or this individual uh, in script." Right. When I was sitting in Angel's house after training, and uh, one of his other students had called while I was there. Um, I don't care to share the name, <laughs> um, but. And then Angel hung up and said, you know, this guy keeps bugging me to write a book. And everybody keeps asking me to write a book. He said, I don't want them to write a book because that means I have to give them my art. So he said, Mark, I want you to write a book. And I want you to write six of them. And we sat in his kitchen and outlined six books on Serata. And I said, but Manong, I don't know, I don't know how to write. I've never done it. I mean, I mean you know, you have to in, in high school, you know, whatever. But I, don't, I, I never even wrote a magazine article ever like I can't even get through my what did I do for summer vacation paper on the first day of school <laughs> you know what I mean where does the comma go what's a what's a noun I don't know um, and he said no you can do it and I, I want you to write it and here's the outline and um, I remember Frank Williams came over and was there when we were talking about it and um, and Angel said okay here's volume one volume two volume three so four five six and this is what we're going to do. And I said, okay, let me just try and start with an article, you know, and uh, as I get, so, uh, you know, let me interview you for your history and your background. And when I get that together, I'll write an article. And I sent that off to Black Belt Magazine. And Jim Coleman, who was the editor at the time, uh, sent me a letter and said, it's almost good enough to publish, but it's not good enough. Um, but it could be good enough. But can you rewrite it? And this is how I'd like you to do it. And I, so I rewrote it and they published The Angel Kabbalah Story, it was the name of the article. And then the next one was the Serrata Screaming System of Angel Cabalas came out both in 1991 or 92. Mm -hmm. And and then those came out while I was writing the first volume. And then Angel uh, wrote the forward for it, and Darren T. Bone's wife typed it up for him, and then Angel signed it and sent it to me. Um, and then he passed away a couple of months before the book actually came off the publisher's press. Um, and 14 publishers turned down the book, 14. I was so bad at writing. I sent it to North Atlantic Press in Berkeley, California, and I got a little postcard back from the publisher, and he told me, he said, no offense, Mr. Wiley, but you're no writer, and we started out as a literary press. <laughs> I still have it. And then I got rejected at O'Hara and Unique, uh, and, you know, and, and, all the, and finally Tuttle Publishing um, picked it up. A year and a half later, after I was so convinced that I needed to write this book for her, for Angel because I felt honored that he had asked me and I had no writing experience. There's no reason he should have asked me other than maybe trust. Um, I don't know, whatever you feel. Mm -hmm. And um, 
and I spent while I was I was in my second year of college and I spent all of the time between my classes in the library reading books on how to write fiction nonfiction poetry how to edit how to do publishing how to do printing how to clean printing presses how to go on a promotional tour uh, and a study that all my you know, in depth all my own like like uh, you know a fanatic uh, rewrote the book, and Tuttle Publishing picked it up, uh, and it was originally called um, Angel Cabalas' Fighting Art, and then they changed the title to Filipino Martial Arts, Colons, Cabalas, Arata, Scrima, and uh, ended up being their fastest selling book up to that point, um, and I think it sold 15,000 copies, and so they signed me to do another book, which I did called Filipino Martial Culture after that, um, and then Patrick McCarthy did a book called The Bubishi, the Bible of Karate, and that sold, that, you know, got the new record for fastest sales right after mine in the same year. So I only had the, the title for like a half a year. <laughs> but anyway, so the answer to the question is Angel Cabalas planted that seed, asked me to do something I'd never done before, took me out of my comfort zone. I forced myself and taught myself how to learn it so I wouldn't let him down. And I actually became a writer as a profession. Uh, interestingly, mostly about martial arts in the beginning and the last 10 years more on health than martial arts. But... Was, uh, when, when the book, when you were developing the book, and when you had initially decided to release the book, um, was it uh, was it well received within the community? <laughs> no. Um, it um, the book the book was well received by everybody. The idea of it, while Angel was alive, mm-hmm. um, everybody was so excited it was coming out. Mm-hmm. And uh, finally, Angel will have a book, and you know, blah blah blah. And um, he was supposed to, you know, we were supposed to set up a photo session for me to go out to Stockton and shoot pictures of Angel with, you know, some different students and and myself. And then he passed away, and the publisher had the book ready to go, so I posed for the pictures. But you know, I was already a master of, uh, of the art under Angel, so why not? Of course, of course. And uh, and even if I wasn't, I could just be an advanced instructor. Why not, right? Sure. sure. Also, as the author. So well. Because it came out after he passed away and his pictures weren't there doing the techniques, some people, like everybody was jockeying except for me. A lot, not everybody, I'm sorry to use such strong language, but a lot of the Serata students of Angel were jockeying for position. Who's the head? Who's the grandmaster? Who's going to follow who? It was horrible. You know, somebody stole his school sign at his funeral, you know. Um, somebody who took other people's, you know, pictures that they were taking at the, at, at, and took the film from them. and. And then the art just split it off, and everybody started their own little groups, you know. So it was very uh, some confrontational at that time. Very confrontational, yeah. Just like Wing Chun with Yip Man, you know. And Lung Ting and Mo Yat and William Chung and Hawkins and Wang Chung Lung, and they all split out to be their own the grandmaster. After. <laughs> but you all had the same teacher, like, you know, have a council of masters. That's better. Uh, but anyway, so... I tried to stay out of that. Being being on the opposite coast, it was easier to stay out of the, the fray, so to speak. face-to-face stuff. But man, the backlash! The book came out, and everybody and and not a, a lot of people were still in support of it. But quite a few people who wanted to be the head of the system started uh, slandering it online, uh, slandering me and my credentials, and whatever. One of the big big detractors of mine. Um, we had the two, it was saying I wasn't qualified and the book stunk and you know blah blah blah. Actually, he and I actually shot an instructional videotape together, uh, like two months before that was going to be released, and we were both on there as co-equals, you know, alternating sure. techniques. Uh, the tape didn't come out because of the falling out of him battle, backlashing and so forth and whatever. But um, yeah, it's just surprising that we can be. Uh, co-equals as long as Angel's alive, right? <laughs> <laughs> and as soon as he passes away, forget it. You know, it's uh, all bets are off. And then one of the, you know, l- lower-ranked uh, instructors was uh, for 15 years dogging me. And some of Mikey Nye's guys hated me. I don't know why. Mike Mike, and I were were good friends and, uh, well, uh, were friendly. And certainly um, I gave him all my respects. And mm-hmm. But I guess he felt when I went to Angel and... Um, and didn't join his group, which is what he was hoping. And I was, we were talking about anyway, with me joining his group before Angel took me in and said, Mark, I want you to come and just train with me privately. And of course, how can I pass up that? He's the the master of these other ma- teachers, you know, and he's the 
the head of that system, who I mean, who wouldn't take that opportunity? Um, and I thought that I could just be, you know, friends and and uh, exactly. classmates. You know, sure they'll be my seniors, sure. you know, in that art, but we're still now classmates under the same teacher. Right. Um, you know, there was no disrespect of me thinking I was, <laughs> you know, higher ranked than them or something. But uh, boy, so there was a big backlash from that group um, during that time. Uh, I didn't hear, I and I never heard anything from any of the, um, you know, Mike never said anything, Mikey and I never said anything to me negatively himself, and uh, some of the other Serata masters never did, they were always in support, it was always kind of the junior guys, except for that one Serata guy who shot a video with me, you know, right. but, um, you know, it was always like the, the under, the under students who were jockeying for whatever, I, I'm not sure what the problem was, um, and now, like, Jay, you know, Mikey and I's son, Jason, and I are friendly, and, and uh, you know, he contributed to a new project that I'm working on, and I don't know what the problem is, um, but but there it was. So um, a couple of years passed, and I decided to, the book was coming up for reprint, and I asked the publisher if I could do a new edition of it. Some of the people were saying, oh, my Mark's um, positions are wrong in the book, and he's not doing Serata, and it's all whatever, whatever. I said, okay. I'll come out to Stockton in the lion's den, get you all together in the same room, you know. You guys can tell me whatever you want to tell me. You want to spar, we spar. You want to do whatever, we'll do whatever. And we'll shoot new pictures with you guys in it. And I'll step out of the book, um, and uh, we'll include you guys. Well, uh, all those guys, you know, who are in the book, it's called The Secrets of Kabbalah, Serata Scream. And Vincent is there, Vincent Kabbalah, and Gabriel Sanchez, and Darren Tibone, and Ronnie Saturno, and uh, Frank Rulliamas, and um, Art Miraflor, I'm trying to remember who else, um, are all, Khalid Khan, are all uh, contributing in the book, there on, on, the, on the photo day, and lots of Anthony Davis. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of, um, boy, the <laughs> amount of adrenaline, <laughs> in that room and the, and the anger and the, and the posturing between everybody was crazy the most interesting thing for me there was um, uh, during that day was number one there was always a riff in Stockton between the Bahalana guys and the Serata guys um, and um, Tony Samara who has you know inherited the system the head system from Leo Hirone mm -hmm. Tony and I were very close friends and Leo Hirone and I were friendly and um, Tony actually set up the shooting session in his in his the gym that he's a member of, and and secured the space for us, and brought everyone together for for that. So Tony and I were were hoping through our actions to bridge the Bahalana Serrata yeah. gap. Mm -hmm. And what we got was while I'm at the shooting session, there's all these people saying, "What's he doing here? Why do you got Bahalana here?" And I thought you were Serrata, and it's like really. This is where the mentality is in this art, you know, in this town. It's uh, Angel never talked like that, really. I mean, he had some things to say, but he never. He was always one to, to look for bridges, you know. We were trying to. Tony and I were trying to bridge, and I, the, those two groups, and I was trying to bridge all the Serata guys together, because they hadn't been all together really since Angel had passed away. So it was kind of a marker, and um, and then we're all posing together in the book, and then the book comes out. It was the number two selling book in Stockton on Amazon.com, and uh, it did well. And then everybody was complaining that everybody else looked horrible. Oh, their stance is wrong. His this arm is wrong. His block is wrong. This guy doesn't know how to do lock and block. Ha ha ha. And I'm like, oh, now you see, right? When you when you when you pose out there in front of everyone, you see how nobody else thinks you're right because maybe their left foot is turned, you know, east, <laughs> right. you know, right. and it's got, and it's wrong. They don't understand. So it's a concept. There's, you know, you have to hold a distance, and there's a combination, and there's a, a, a structure to the blocks, et cetera, but there's a concept on the movement, and it's all individual. It's based on height and shape and exactly, body weight. Exactly, because everyone's and mechanic. body is different. Movement yeah. is the same, but everybody's body size is different. So I, being 6'2 and 250, are not going to look like you doing the same thing. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> and it's just, uh, yeah, so I said, you know, guys, there it is. Now you guys can all yell at each other and leave me alone, and uh, and you see, you know, really, <laughs> it's uh, trouble for nothing. You know, right. it's, it's, you're arguing over stupid things because we're all teaching the same art from the same the same master, right? We're all brothers here, you know. So I um, 
promoted them, and it was good because I had been to the Philippines, I don't know, at that point, maybe six or seven times already. And I had and I had the very fortunate um, opportunity to meet one of uh, Felicity Simotis on it with Angel Cabal's the teacher. His training partner is named Modesto Madrigal, uh-huh. who was the member, the last surviving member of the original Dosi Paris group from Laguna, which is different from the Dosi Paris group in Cebu, the Kenyates and the and the Anshan Bacon groups and et cetera. So it's a different Dosi Paris that was there prior to the Dosi Paris as we know them today. Uh-huh. You know. And uh, man, I, I got to meet him and I sparred with him, did some sparring with him and did some training. And it was so interesting because he had the same series of stick postures uh, that Angel used and the same series that Antonio Illustrissimo uses. Really? And um, some of the movements, it's like, wow, if you just looked at it, you would think, hey, there's a guy who does like in kind of an old style, a serrata ish kind of art. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and then I found out, you know, I trained for a bunch of years with. Um, under Antonio Illustrissimo, and um, and uh, he was best friends with Felicissimo Di Zon, and they worked on the Tondo shipping piers together as security, and Angel Cabalas worked on those piers as a student of Di Zon. Um and Floro Villabria is the, was the younger nephew of Antonio Illustrissimo. I see. So that's why the Angel's Serrata style looks like a tighter, shorter system of the Lagusa style, Villabria style, which looks like a longer Serrata with <laughs> more circling steps. But basically, the structure is kind of similar, you uh-huh. know. Uh-huh. Sure. And that because the, the, they were right there together. And this old man Madrigal from from Laguna, same thing. And I was like, oh, this is. So I got to just ask him so many questions, interview. I shot a hundred photographs, a video, you know. Right. Uh, did that with all of my all of my research and uh, put some of that in the second book. And I met another of their of their friends, um, Jose Mina, who's also passed away, uh, whose art looks nothing like any of the arts of the teachers I just mentioned. But he was their companion. Their, he was their their um, you know their partner, right? Their, uh, so um, you know he knew all the same stories, all the. All the same things. All same the, running brothers, so to speak. Yeah, run. You know, we do different art, but we hang out. We run. We right. we spar. We do this and that. And uh, yeah, and I and went up and down the Philippines, spent time in Mindanao, Visayas, Luzon, meeting and training with all these different teachers and grandmasters. And so many of them have passed away. It's such a fortunate time when I was there to capture them on film and in pictures and interview them and put them in my book. So. I brought some of that back into the Serrata book in the second, the second Serrata book. Mm-hmm. Some of the history that I was able to get in the Philippines to add to what Angel would say, because you know what he remembered and what he knew, and I, and uh, to kind of fill that out a little bit. So I, back I to uh, and, and that's, that's fascinating. I mean, that is simply fascinating. Back to Stockton and, and yeah. back to the event or the the uh, photo shoot that you had done uh, with uh, Grandmaster Tony Sinari had set up for you, and uh, back to that rift between Mahalo and Serrata, right. Stockton. Um, what's your relationship with Dan Toy Reservoir? Um, I don't know porch, that there. That I, I don't know that that there's an actual relationship. I, I think we're we're friendly. Certainly, I've been over his home. Uh, I've, I've had a you know barbecue <laughs> uh-huh. at his home. Um, I have a picture with me and him and Tony Samara in his living room. Um, then Toy didn't want, when I was doing the um, when I started writing Filipino martial culture. Mm-hmm. Then Toy um, didn't want to be involved, but he was willing to talk to me on the phone as much as I wanted. I see. Um, but I, I think he didn't know me, you know. All I had out was the Serrata book, and I think he was not a fan of it for whatever reason. Right. Um, maybe he didn't get enough, you know, mention in it or something as being one of Angel's first students, mm-hmm. and that was probably a misstep on my part. Uh, but a young and in, young, young and uh, inexperienced at writing, you know. Sure. Um, so I did mention him, and I think I put his picture in the uh, second book, and also Jimmy Tacosa and some of the other old uh, people, Mikey and I. I got them into the second book. Serrata book. Um, so are there two separate entities then within Bahá'u'lláh, the part that Tony Samara represents? There is now. Dentoy right. Rebel are part of, is that correct? Well, yeah, so I guess Dentoy was a student of, he was kind of like the, the triangulator of Stockton, I call it, you know. Okay. I think he was, because he was able to train with Angel Cabalas, 
he was able to train with Leo Hiron, mm -hmm. and he was able to train with Max Sarmiento. Mm -hmm. uh, so he cr he kind of put that together into his own system, uh, the Cuerdas Serrata Larga Mano uh, style that he teaches. And um, but I think it's I I don't know enough, you know, super a lot about it and. Mm -hmm. When I've talked to Den Toy since, um, he's been open to do some projects, you know, to do something with me, we, and I'm hoping he'll contribute to my new project. Sure. Um, but, um, you know, the stories I get from Angel and then the stories I got from Leo Hiron and other old-timers in Stockton, it's just so much politics. I, I'm almost afraid to just start repeating them because it's almost like giving it legs and new life, right? No, of course, I don't want to get... Right, I, I no, so, I, and, and it, for me, it's just hearsay, right? So... I, I, um, I, I think there's a, I think Dentoy is promoting his own art that has the three systems in it. Mm -hmm. So I don't think he's claiming Bahalana or just claiming Serata. He's like doing his composite system, which is probably the best way to stay out of everybody else's politics, sure, right? No, no, absolutely. But I know that after Manong Leo passed away, you know, some of the guys didn't want to follow along with what Tony Somera was doing, even though that was Leo's wish. Mm -hmm. uh, at least during, you know, I, I, I visited him in the senior center, you know, uh, um, and worked on his, I, I helped publish his book on the, uh, his, his uh, Heron system that came out. And, um, you know, so, but I guess, you know, you have different tigers in one cave, right? Different, <laughs> different masters of the art when the, when the head guy's gone and everybody wants to breathe and, and they have the right to want to teach the way they want to teach or, do what they want to do, but you don't have to be mad at each other to do it. Of you can just say, I'm going to have my club here, and you have yours there, and we're all good, but martial arts being what it is. <laughs> now back, and, uh, of course, and, and, yeah. and back to the um, Serrata family, as yeah. were, did, did you have a relationship at all or training with Max Sarmiento? Or no, I didn't, no. Uh -huh. do you, uh, what do you feel that his influence upon the art of Serrata Escrima was? Um, how do you think that that changed? What was prevented? I, uh, you know, there's there's the the urban the urban legends that we get. Uh, for those of us who didn't grow up in Stockton, you sure. know, that we hear was like, oh, you know, back then, Angel was the you know the fastest and best stick fighter, and and Max uh, Sarmiento was um, was like the the empty hand mano a mano guy, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know. Who could, uh, you know, doing empty hand stuff and whatever? But so then I go out and Angel tells me, you know, Max didn't really know any martial arts. He was just a street fighter, and he was Filipino. And certain other Filipino people who wrote about the art in the 70s and 80s would say that he was Philippine empty hand because they're looking for something okay. to identify something. But it doesn't, but it doesn't mean that Max wasn't teaching it because later I see old black and white footage of Max doing techniques. Right, so you could, but so you could say, okay, it was Angel grinding his axe, or did Max just pick up something from translating stick to empty hand because Angel said Max was his student. Right, because Max was, in other words, that Max was just so good at identifying the technique and making that translation to empty hand right. automatically, so to speak. Right, but it doesn't mean he came from a tradition of Philippine empty hand sure. or mono fighting or something, which some people have put forth, you know. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, but I also know that Angel, Angel didn't learn any empty hand in the Philippine arts uh, in the Philippines. He, so he got the disarm, but he didn't against empty hand against weapon. Mm -hmm. But Angel told me that he 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 developed out and applied the hand on hand stuff after he started teaching commercially here I because see. people needed it because not everybody was armed. Uh -huh. You couldn't walk around with your bolo like you know. He learned because he was working on the shipping pier and he needed to have his he had his bolo, which is why his I mean his baton excuse me, which is why the serrata stick is shorter. Because Angel didn't learn it as a, as a standard size stick art, he learned it on the shorter thing while at work, while on the on the docks with Dizon. But Dizon used a regular size stick. So, and Dizon's art was called was called the Cuerdas, and um, and what he taught Angel with the shorter stick was a method of applying it called Serrada, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so they say what I got from the Philippines when I was there was that. You know, Angel mastered the art of Serrata, but the art was two. There's Serrata and Abierta, and he didn't get the Abierta techniques. Um,
because he wasn't using the longer stick and using the wider movements. And Alberto so meaning for those. Alberto is an open guard, uh, rather than that closed serrata where the one arm is crossed across your body. Uh -huh. It's almost up like a boxing stance, like uh, the Illustrissimo people stand, or, or a boxer with the sword sticking straight up. You know. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And there's a set of techniques that comes off of that that is different because the 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 lead-in and the application is different because the hand positioning is different. You know, and Angel had like against angle one, you step out and do an 11 to right. the arm, like right. little micro lar larga mono moves, right? Because sure. the stick was shorter. But there's a whole system of movement like that, that, um, you know, according to the other people that I met who were so affiliated with Tison, said that uh, the system includes that they don't see from Angel or Angel students that have gone to the Philippines, you know. Right. So, but, so Angel, but Angel just said he's a master of serrata, right? So there's no misrepresentation there. Right. right. And he was really, really, really good. So cool. you don't need all of those techniques. You don't need all the obvious, you know, to still be an effective escrimador, right? Uh, so it's no, I'm not trying to put any shortcoming against, you know, our, our teacher, our grandmaster. Uh, of course so. not, of course not. But, and, um, and, and back to the, and, and back to that, though, Mark, if you will, uh, in, in in a comparison, the de Cuerdas, uh of the zone and de Cuerdas, uh of the Tineo system, is no, there different. totally different, yes. Well, from, from now, okay, I did not know Gilbert Tineo, and I haven't seen his system in person. Uh -huh. However, I will say that what Angel told me was, and then I, this was corroborated with Leo Hirone as well, okay. uh, so again, this is coming secondhand for me. But I got it from a first-hand source, sure. but not from Tinio himself. Was that um, um, Angel told the word and gave the word uh, de Cuerdas in conversation to Tinio, and taught him some serrata, and Tinio had some jujitsu or something. Okay. Uh, and then he just called his art de Cuerdas. I see. But there was no existing de Cuerdas system there for him. I see. Right, and it was certainly was not his own system, right? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, and I can't, I, and that's all I can really say on it. I, sure. Which is why I didn't write anything about it. I just don't know. No, of course, no. I, was I just don't know enough. But you know, there's all yeah. those stories are there, and you, and I think you're the guy to corroborate them all because you're talking to so many people. <laughs> you know. Well, I hope so, and that's and that's yeah. part of the uh, that's part of the interview process because right. uh, and there's so much knowledge to be had mm -hmm. about everything can fit into a magazine article, and certainly not everything can be fit into a book necessarily. No, certainly not, yeah. After the edit, of course, since you and I both know. Uh, mm, but, right. Uh, but, but at any rate, being that there are two, possibly three different variations of the Aquarius, uh, I, I thought that perhaps there may be some similarity or there might be uh, some developmental similarity in those systems. Yeah. Uh, you know, I I don't really have an answer for that one to be honest. You know, I, I wish that I had been able to to meet or train or interview uh, Mastertinio back then, uh, but I was I was not you know, fortunate to have that opportunity. Um, but I it it doesn't seem like there's any kind of historical connection with Dizon or Angel or their particular Dequeras. You know, Angel's style original was Dequeras. He just changed, he adopted the name. Serrata because of his mastery of that part of it. Uh, within grand, uh, within Grandmaster Angel's system of teaching, his right. methodology, what was his progressionary uh, measures? Was it, uh, uh, and by that, I guess I mean, at what point did he progress a student from uh, number one to number two? To number three? Okay. Was there a level cutoff at that point? Right. So. Uh, he had two methods of teaching, and he, and he uh, taught them both to me, and they're very simple, I'll tell you them in a second. Sure. He taught them both to me and told me that it's my choice how I want to progress the art with a student. I can use one of two ways. Of course, I, you know, I can use any way you want, but he was propagating uh, a t a two different tracks of instruction. One is that you would teach three angle, three defenses against each angle. So three against angle one, inside block, I don't know, umbrella block, outside block, okay? Three against angle two, three, four, five. Mm -hmm. When you get to angle five, you start lock and block, you start your flow sparring, mm -hmm. and you start some basic disarms. And then you go four, five, six, seven, oh, excuse me, after seven, then you start the disarms. 
and then you go through 12, okay? Uh, and then your, your picks, your reversals, and different things, and empty hand came after angle seven as well. The second way was you spend one month on each angle, and you do all the counters for that angle. So for angle one, there were 14 basic counters. So I guess there's three basic counters, but there was 14 common counters sure. for angle one. So then you get all you get through all 14 counters in angle one, uh, stick counters. That's not including empty hand or the disarming. And then you start on angle two, and then you go through the whole set on angle two, however many that there were, um, three, four, five down the line. Some of them, you know, uh, one and six, you know, part and, and partly five and. Right and two and three and, and the other half of five are all kind of similar, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, some of them like angles, um, you know, angle nine only had like seven or eight uh, counters, uh, stick counters that were that were fundamental. But you could take a student through that progression too. So sometimes when I go out and, and I'd be training with him, we would just do three, 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 go through the lock and block, go through the flowing, uh, get up, then start disarming, and then go up and then do, um, uh, counters, uh, picks, reversals, uh, et cetera, et cetera, through all of them. And then another time we go through and we just spend the whole day on angle one, the whole day on angle two, angle three, and do all the techniques against each of the angles. But either way, at the end of a year, you're almost at the same place if you're training consistently, right? Mm -hmm. exactly. Because you'd have to go one to 12 with three counters each and then repeat down and do three more each. Now you've got six on each and then repeat back. Whichever one had more than six, you'd right. start adding those, tacking those on. Uh, but the uh, but the the lock and block and the flow and the disarming et cetera all came at those kind of set places. Anyway, so at the end of a period of time, you would have the same amount of information if you stuck around and practiced the three. You'd get to four, you know, right. and right. five and six and seven. Some people just stopped. You know, they got three counters on each and that was enough, or they got six in, on each and that was enough. And, mm -hmm. You know, their art's not a, not my art. <laughs> you of know. Course. So where, 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 when you were studying with Angel, where was his progressionary, um, where were his levels of progression, his basic, his uh, advanced, and, and beyond? So the basic was uh, anyone who did an intensive kind of, uh, you know, a seminar mm -hmm. or a weekend training or something like that, he would give it a basic um, for that. And it was almost like... Um, you know, you just learn the foundation of the sure. art. It was, you know, whatever. And then, and then he had the advanced degree, which was really, I think, like you know, you could say like a, a second or a third dan, really, because you have to learn so much material. And then the only rank after that is master, right? Right, which you could say is fourth or fifth or whatever, you know. Right. So it's really like you're like yellow belt, <laughs> second dan, but you know that if, if we're if we're trying to equate it to a yeah, belt. So system, which they didn't use in the Philippines until, you know, in the 50s. So um, it's kind of kind of strange, and a lot of people didn't think there was a difference between advanced and master's degree training, and there actually was a difference, and there's new, different material, and the concepts and the way that they're taught um, is different. And now Darren T. Bowen's been putting some of it out on, the, on his instructional DVDs, and people are like, wow, Angel never taught that. I was like, yeah, he did. That was the stuff that you're saying that wasn't there, mm -hmm. just because he wasn't doing it in class, you know. So there's a whole group of people who don't, uh, in the Serata, who don't, who don't think that there was more. And when I wrote that there was more in my first screen, Serata book, mm -hmm. man, big backlash. They're like, oh, that's bullshit, you know. There's no additional stuff. There's no secret techniques. There's no second set of counters. There's no only, you know, handful of people got it or something and whatever. And it's like, well, really, that's what Angel said. I don't know. I, I was young and naive. I didn't, you know, didn't think about politics when I was writing the book. Mm -hmm. But now that uh, the other information has come out and people are seeing it, they're like, oh, yeah, I guess there is something different, you know. And, uh, Darren was telling me he had a conversation with um, Jeff Finder, another Serata practitioner, the other day about that, when he was asking Darren about that progression, he said, no, there's no difference, and Darren was telling him, just explaining to him how it was different. And uh, and then Darren put some of it out on his on his third DVD, and he just shot three more with that material, and it's exactly line for line what was what I learned with Angel in his living room at the Academy, and what some of us were doing that the other... I just assumed everybody else was doing it, you know, but evidently... <laughs> 
Evidently not, which is why some of them were angry about what I wrote. They thought I was making some stuff up. Mm -hmm. Kind of interesting. You know, ignorance is, uh, yeah, it's hard to overcome sometimes. It sometimes is, certainly. So uh, in in your uh, in, in your uh, recent uh, in your recent book uh, yeah. or recent books, you're uh, you're going to be promoting the disarms within the field right. of martial arts. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Now, is that the book that you worked on with uh, Mr. Anderson, or was that a different uh, publication? Yeah, that one. Well, what happened was um, um, after Filipino martial culture, I did two more Filipino books: one on history of the art. And then another one after that on called Filipino Fighting Arts, where there was 25 arts back to back, um, explained in terms of training progression, fighting skills, and key concepts and strategies that they use with pictures. So it was no history. It was just each art had a had a sections for how do you train, how do you fight, what are your strategies, and what's your training method, uh -huh. and then technique pictures. So 25 arts were in there. And I thought that's a pretty cool book. Um, shows a lot of different styles, doing a lot of different things. And then I decided after that to write another book on uh, with my doing another instructional book. That one was, you know, wasn't really instructional. It was it was uh, conceptual information uh, to take away and, and and learn about other arts, and then lots of technique pictures. But it wasn't instructional per se. So. I actually, Inside Kung Fu came to me and said, you know, we'd like you to do a, a series of three books. And I said, okay. Um, <clears throat> and DVDs to go with them. And I said, okay. So what do you want to do them on? And they said, well, can you do double sticks and spadi daga and disarming? And I said, sure. Yeah, because there's, there's no real kind of, the books that, are, that have been out there have been on systems. You know, Remy mm -hmm. Presas's book that had this 12 strikes and the defenses and some disarms and the Serata books, the same thing, you know and Dan's book, same thing, but there wasn't a book just like on one particular aspect of the art, sure. like just double sticks. Well, Ray Gawling's book had come out on Sinawali, though, but, um, or Espadi Daga, or Disarming. So I said, okay, so I wrote the Disarming book, and I wrote the double stick book, or maybe the Espadi Daga book, and turned them in uh, just with me doing the techniques and explaining and the concepts and the principles, theories and strategies, a lot of um, conceptual information in the book. And then Inside Kung Fu ended up closing down, and Unique Publications was kind of in a holding pattern, and then they closed down also the, the book publishing arm. So the book just sat from 2008, uh, 2006 until 2009 in kind of a limbo. Uh, and I hadn't flown out to shoot the photos for the book in the studio because they didn't know what, what they were happening with the magazine and everything. So 2009 comes along, and the editor, Dave Cater, of Inside Kung Fu, said, we, we know we need the pictures. Uh, we're going to go ahead and push through. And I said, okay. And I was talking to Dan Anderson on the phone, and, uh, and Dan said, hey, can I come out, and we'll do the pictures. To I said, oh, I don't have a photographer, and i got to set up a thing. And, I, you know, I just my head wasn't in it at that point. And so many years had passed. And Dan said, hey, I have this high-speed digital camera. Uh, oh, no, I had shot the pictures twice. And they came out horribly because the photographer got like art, you know, from the knee to way above the head, <laughs> and the next shot from like the eyeball to the toes. Oh my goodness! You know, I think my six-year-old took the pictures, and I shot the whole series twice. And on the second shoot, my students showed up in the street clothes and forgot to bring, you know, training oh, pads no. and stuff. And I'm like, you know what? I so I shot it anyway because they, they were bugging me for the pictures. Of course, I owed them the pictures. Sure. So I shot the whole set twice, like 600 photos twice. Uh -huh and sent it in and I mean didn't send it in because I was so upset about it and I was telling this to Dan Anderson and Dan said look I have a high speed motor camera that's digital you can do the whole thing and I was complaining that I didn't like that you can't see the dynamic of the movement when you're standing there posing frozen you know right. the scream is an alive art it's not posed right? right and it looks like you're kind of stiff and robot-y looking if you're not moving mm -hmm. and he said I have this high speed digital camera and um and I'm, you know, can I come out and be in the pictures with you? And now, and we'll just get them done. And I was like, yeah, of course, you know. And um, so we set up a seminar for Dan at a student of mine's school to play his airfare to come out, so he wouldn't have to lose money to be in my book. <laughs> and and we shot the whole set in full in uh, full motion, you know. I just sat there. He'd attack. I said, give me this angle, give me this angle, and I just sit there and blow through all the disarms and 
motion. And then we had like a, you know thousands of digital pictures, sure. which was great because then you can still find the 10 within that set of 15 or 20 of one technique right. that can make a good sequence where you have the kind of the transitional moves right, right. and not just the like, I block and now he's in a neck lock. Like, how right. do you get the neck lock? Exactly. Right. And you the transition is so important, right? Because that's It's the most important. If you miss the transition, you, yeah. you miss the entire technique almost. Yes, exactly. And so we were, and so that was great. And then Dan said, I'm working on another book. I, can you post for some of my pictures? And I was like, yeah, I'll attack you, sure. So he shot pictures for his a book on principles of Filipino martial arts uh, and then put a picture of the two of us on the cover of it. it was, I was very honored. And uh, so I got to be able to pose in Dan's book. And then uh, Dan wrote the forward for the disarming book and then asked me to write the forward for his book, which I did while I was in Manila and emailed it to him. Um, and then and are those two books uh, presently out now? Or? His book is out. Dan's book is out. And he's like, you know, I was very prolific for about a 10-year period in martial arts where I did like 300 articles and 10 books. Sure. But Dan's done like 12 books in like five years or something. And like, he just, he's like a machine. He doesn't, <laughs> he doesn't stop. I don't know where he gets his energy. He must be that Oregon air, <laughs> you know. Uh but he's so energetic, and so he's been just pumping these things out. And, and that book, his Filipino martial art, or he, he's got quite a few. He has one on truncata, the locking techniques. Uh -huh. He has a disarming book called Defanging the Snake, which he gave me, and I refused to read it while I was writing mine <laughs> because I didn't want, I didn't want to copy. Like, sure. what if he had some really great stuff in there? Exactly. Am I just going to copy and pretend it. it's mine? <laughs> you know. And I was like, There's no, I, I don't want to do that. I, of, uh, Dan Anderson. <laughs> yeah, and he said, Well, what do you think of the book? I said, I'll let you know when I finish mine. <laughs> because I don't want to copy your format. I don't want to talk like you, and I don't want to cover your like. I, let, I have a, it's in my head. Let me yeah. just write what I want to write. You know. Right. Right. So his book is pretty. It's very good. So he's written a bunch. He self-published them, and you can get them on Amazon or on his website. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But the, unfortunately, they didn't make it to the bookstores yet. Yeah. Um, so Dan wrote the forward for mine. I wrote the forward for his, and you know he shot the photos and brought his camera and and. Um, that was in 2009, and then the publisher closed down completely and said, "We're not. You can have the book back. We're not going to do it." And it's just wow. been sitting and sitting, and I just left it there. I like just left it sitting in a box, and then I decided I got some energy a couple months ago and decided to look at it again. I was like, "Wow, this book sucks," and like totally not good enough. Uh, not for me at this point, you know. So I spent. You know, another month, and I added 20 new pages of text, concepts, principles, theories. What are the key points in this? What are the common mistakes? How to avoid them? How do you control range? How do you co control gait and position? All things that I just took for granted and didn't really explain in the first round. So I'm really happy. Then I thought, I've got thousands of photographs from my travels to the Philippines and U.S., meeting all these teachers, thousands. And I thought, I wonder if I have any pictures of these masters and masters like doing disarms. Sure. It'd be really cool to have like a little extra section with like three or four techniques, you know, just as kind of a, a collector's thing or whatever. Absolutely. And I open up these big, huge plastic bins I have with these photos, and and I started going through them. And I'm like, huh. Well, there's like four from four complete sets of disarms from the Illustrissimo system, right. and here's a whole bunch from La Punti, and here's Balintawak, and here's Bikiti Tertia, and here's this one, and this one, and this one, and this one. And finally, I stacked them all out. I counted 75 techniques wow. and 25 different Filipino styles. Oh, my goodness. In addition to the 42 instructional disarms with the full instructional and all the stuff that I'd already written. Oh, my goodness. I was like, this is this is fantastic. This, now I'm excited because who cares about me? Like, I know my stuff, but now I'm like, now I gotta, we get to see their stuff, which plays in with the theme of what I've been writing since my first book, which is don't just focus it on me, but focus it on the elder masters. Of course. Focus it on promoting the arts as a whole. Give everybody some credit. Let the art grow and bloom. Sure. And, um, you know, it doesn't say the secret disarming techniques of Mark Wiley's integrated Escrima. You know, it says just mastering disarms featuring 25 styles, you know. Yeah. So I have these amazing photographs of Illustrissimo doing sword, this sword on sword disarms and Espadi Daga disarms and Edgar Solite and, um, you know, man, a whole bunch of masters you never heard of <laughs> that are over there and Vinyas and Vinyas and Tor Tortal and uh, Leo Gahe and 
uh, some teachers from uh, Mindanao, Ilipasco, and um, man, just on and on and on and on and on. Um, just, just really terrific stuff. Um, uh, for Serata, I know everybody's got their own groups. I wanted to include lots of people, so I've got Darren T. Bone yeah. and Ronnie Saturno and Frank Williamas and Anthony Davis all doing their own techniques within the Serata segment. Uh -huh. um, and it's just, man, I, I'm so excited. Benjamin Luna Lima, um, uh, Lightning Scientific, one of my other teachers. Just uh, and, and so many of those masters have passed away, right. and there's no books on their art. Or right. Ben Lima had a book published in the Philippines, but only like a three or five hundred run print or a hundred run, uh -huh. not many copies. And it's, you know, such a shame. And I thought, man, wow, I could really. I didn't know. I, I mean, I know I have a lot of stuff, but I didn't know that I had so many disarms. So really worked out well where I can help promote all these arts and um, you know show this kind of uh, you know you have your basic disarms whatever names you want to call them the common ones over here most people use Inasano's terms which is like snake strip sure. vine quick release you uh -huh. know um, and those are kind of common American names for the disarms mm -hmm. and so basically they they're, they're concepts you know you insert your stick and move the other guy's stick over yours creating right. a lever over his Forum, right? right. So, but there's many ways to accomplish that. So, in that, in the first, in in the section of the book where I'm demonstrating techniques, you see all the basic plain vanilla kind of, here's how you disarm. But then in the section with all these different masters, you're seeing the same disarm done 15 ways. You know, different leg forward, different range, different position, different setup, or different follow up. Uh -huh. Some guys disarm and go into a lock. Another guy disarms and goes into a, a choke. Another guy disarms and just hits the guy. You know, uh, it's so it's so interesting. You know, so diverse. So you, yeah, you can see all that. You know, just just going right through it. Um, That's exciting. And when is that book going to be released? Well, it's it's being published by Empire Books, which okay. is the book book publishing arm of Masters Magazine. Right. And actually, right before this call, I was on the phone with Jose Fraguas, an old friend of mine who's the publisher, and he said it, it's going to start going to layout in a couple of. Uh, months because they have already their schedule set up for this year, so it will be done probably by the end of this year. Okay. But I'm hoping to get a a digital uh, copy of it out this year, and then the print because I as soon as the layout's done, the digital copy is ready, right. and then have the print the print version next year sure. uh, in early 2013 because they have to get these other four books out first. Uh, so I'm hoping hoping in a couple of months that the digital version will be available. That's, but I'm, that's I'm exciting. Excited. I'm looking forward to it. Oh, thanks. I'm, I'm excited about it. And I know already some people are upset. <laughs> Why is that? You know, my phone's been ringing off the hook. It's uh -huh. like, uh, we hate you because you didn't put my teacher in your other books. <laughs> and you suck because Ernesto Presas isn't in it. And how come Remy didn't get a chapter in Filipino right. martial culture? He was even your teacher. And I was like, well, yeah, he's got so much publicity, he didn't need his own chapter. His name was mentioned, his picture's in there, but the chapters were mainly for a lot of people who didn't have publicity yet. And that there are other arts there than the guys in Stockton, you know. Right. Right. Not only that, but Remy refused to be in the book. I interviewed him, and then he said he doesn't want to be in it because he didn't like some of the other teachers. Okay. Um, some of, and some of his stories didn't really pan out, you know, as is often the case with a lot of, a lot of these guys. Right. Um, the stories that we heard in the 70s and 80s, Oh, you know, didn't pan out when you get to the motherland. And, <laughs> and so tell, me, and tell me something, not to get off track of that, yeah. so hot, but, uh, in, in relationship to uh, to the written art, man, in relationship to the books, yeah. initially, earlier on in our conversation, you'd spoken, you'd sat down with uh, Angel. Angel had set out an outline for six months. Yes. What happened to those? So the publisher said, we don't want to do six books. We've never published a Filipino martial art book. Um, I think Dan Anasanos and Remy Prices were like the only ones in English. Oh, Matt Marinas had one with Unique uh -huh. uh, on Panananda, uh, Arnis Lanada at that time. Uh -huh. uh, and, and the publisher said, you know, we don't know. We've been doing karate books and judo books, sure. and um, we're not sure if we can sell that kind of a book. Uh -huh. So can you give us one overview book? I see. And if it sells really well, then we can do more. Mm -hmm. So I combined it into one book, like a, just a shorter overview book, which is the I one agree. that you guys saw. And then that one sold well, and it went into three print runs, but then they asked for a, a broader 
scope book, which is I got I did Filipino martial culture. I see. I see. And I just went over the I just went overboard. <laughs> sure. uh, and uh, and then they weren't interested in doing these system specific books anymore. Right. Right. They wanted to stay with the broader mm -hmm. broader stuff. But I was able to get uh, Leo Hiron's book done uh, through that publisher uh, and Ray Galang's as well, the Sinawali book. Mm -hmm. uh, but then they didn't really want to do more of the system specific books but the outline for those books is in the appendix of the second Serata book The Secrets of Kabbalah Serata okay. I put the um, outline Angel had given in that book and uh, some people even thought I made up the forward in the first book that Angel had written for me because it was just it was just typed and then his name was there typed right. you know so in the second book I took the original letter that has a signature in ink and I scanned it and they printed it uh, in the book, you know, and uh, and Darren T. Bone's wife typed it for Angel and signed it, and then they mailed it to me. So come on, people just want to you know, pick on stupid things. I don't know. And it's amazing what we can do with digital technology now, as opposed to what we could with show. And right. You know what was truly the truth back then. Yeah. And um, yeah, and I just can't believe how many people are like upset that I didn't put like really came down on me hard for 15 years. Uh -huh on the internet because I didn't include their teacher in a book. Sure. It's like, well, your teacher can write a book. Why don't you write a book for your teacher? Like, sure. I'm one guy and I'm doing more than anyone. Mm -hmm. And well, you know, in terms of trying to put it out in press in this generation, you know, right. Dan and book was terrific. And it had a lot of the teachers from Stockton and Los Angeles and Hawaii and, and the Kenyette, you know, I think he had Juni Kenyette from the Philippines. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it was a uh, man without his book, we wouldn't have any, you know, I saw his, the picture of Angel Cabalas in his book, and I just knew that that had to be my teacher, mm -hmm. sitting there with a cigarette looking badass, you know? <laughs> know. Look, with his big big old wrist bone, you know, and it's just like, wow, man, that guy, and the story about it, how, that Dan had in there about how Angel went into Alaska and c took the tree branch and beat up some guys, I'm like, yeah, <laughs> my nobody's going to get past me, man, I'm going to get a tree branch, you know. I mean, Dan, wow, and Asano, man. He, Him and his red converse tie tie. Right, and the red, and the red Chuck E. T's, the Chuck Taylors, right? Like, come on, man, he's in there playing some ball and go get a stick, All right. whittle it down. I won't stab you, but I'll cut down the stick, you know. And you're just like, wow, what a fascinating story. And and Dan had all these guys in there with these doing his art, and so and such. Man, I just really, uh, really touched me at that time, you know, my, grabbed my spirit. Uh, but unfortunately, his book is out of, you know, went out of print, and it was really focused locally on those teachers, and I wanted to do more. And uh, I wrote a couple more books featuring lots and lots and lots of dozens of styles and teachers, and people are mad because I didn't get their teacher. Right. I, I can't do it all. I mean, you know, 25 styles in the last book, 25 in this book. You know, Martial Culture had six, 17 masters, biographies of the masters, not just a little vignette of one story, but full right. biographies, plus history and culture, and spirituality and you know they can reach out all those people who are mad they can reach out to me and say hello and hi we'd like to contribute something I I can't just every Filipino teacher has his name on his own style everyone's a grandmaster I can't nowadays Absolutely. you know Absolutely. I, I can't be everywhere I'm trying my best and not only that you know, I cut me some that, slack I think that folks know you uh, primarily uh, as an author and as an author of uh, martial arts material however right uh, I mean, you are an acupuncturist, you are an herbalist, I mean, yes. I mean you, you have a profession beyond right. Right. martial arts books, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's my hobby, the martial art writing, you know. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, you know, and a passion, you know. Sure. So many of the histories that we know, we don't, of these, we don't even know the history of some of these arts. Like, the history that we've been told is not really correct. Right. And I, and I can't wait till a couple more teachers pass away in the next couple of decades just so I can write about it and not feel for my life, but <laughs> it'll come out eventually, some of the things. Uh, I look forward you know, to that. <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, it's all written down. I've got it all on audio cassettes recorded, you know, like you're doing, but on right. little micro cassettes, right. you know, you have Skype, you're lucky. Um, but yeah, you know, some of the histories of these arts and who actually trained with who and who the real teachers were. Well, they, it's, it's, I envy I envy your travel and, and I and I envy the personal experience that you 
the cat and touching grandmasters as well as uh, you know touching sticks with them, uh, having you know breaking bread with them and actually having that personal experience. It's a uh, funny story. Uh, you know, one of the advantages of having Skype, of having the digital network as we have it today, is that we as martial artists in general can reach out and we can actually touch the folks who have been influential, like yourself, uh, you know, like, like uh, Guru Dan and Asato, uh, and, actually, uh, and actually speak to those individuals as opposed to wait till the next story or the next article comes out in Black Belt or anything. Right. As I often did when I was initially studying martial arts uh, back in uh, 75 through 79, and I, you know, just Google and wait for that for that right. next issue to come out. And hope and, there was and, something. And, and, and exactly, and, and to be able to speak to one of my, uh, you know, to speak to not only one of, but, but many of my, uh, uh, the, the folks that, that I had read about, you know, yourself being one of those, Dan Anderson, of course, Grandmaster Eric Lee, I've spoken yeah. to Yeah. And, and uh, one of the things that I regret is not starting to do this a lot sooner, simply because... Well, I'd spoken with um, uh, Master Ricky Wazo, the uh, inheritor of his uh, father, Grandmaster uh, Wazo's Luis Aminda Arnis Kalisas, who is also a uh, student of uh, police of his own. Uh, and uh, right before uh, I had spoken to him about a year before, I was going to actually give a call uh, down to his hometown, uh, down, to, uh, down in Tampa, Florida, and ask to speak to his father. And shortly after that, uh, Grandmaster uh, uh, Wazza passed away. Yeah. It, it, it was unfortunate that I did not take the opportunity to start performing, right. start asking for the interviews a lot sooner because I did miss out there. And uh, so whenever I can now, I do reach out to the uh, individuals who are significant, who have been significant within not only Filipino martial arts, but in martial arts in general. Yeah, you're doing it. You're doing a tremendous effort, and with Facebook, it's easy to make that direct contact now. You don't have to go through ten people to get a phone number. Of course, you can just reach out and hope hope they respond, and then develop a relationship and do the interview. Of Fred Lazo and I, interestingly, were friendly for a period, and then, what? boy, did he start not liking me. <laughs> oh no! Sorry. Uh, not liking what I was writing and starting a big bruja. I just found out uh, yesterday or two days ago from a mutual friend that that there's a whole group of people in the Pacific Northwest who don't like me because Fred Lazo said some things about me and then about their other teacher that Fred was supporting and now they don't like me because they think I excluded them all on purpose and and whatever and whatever and I don't know Fred Fred Lazo and I were friendly uh, talking on the phone a lot and mm -hmm. uh, doing letters if you remember what those were mm -hmm. um, Please, yeah. yeah and I know that he he had According to him, he had known and uh, done some brief training with Felicissimo Dizon mm -hmm. in the Philippines, and he was friends, uh, friendly with his son, uh, Boy Dizon. And he gave me some bits of information that um, I was able to use um, in the second Serrata book. And I credited his name as giving me that information, or maybe it was in Filipino martial culture, I forget. And then, well, I guess he didn't, uh, he didn't like that people were calling him out on the information. Um, you know, saying, well, that's not true, and that's not true. And many of the masters in Filipino martial mm -hmm. culture put forth histories of their art that didn't jive with the history that I wrote as, as a separate anthropological and historical study in the beginning part of the book, and didn't jive with what the other teachers were saying, and they were actually yelling at each other and trying to back out of what they said to me. And I was like, well, I left your arts in the oral tradition that you told me in that section of the book mm -hmm. to match the people can say, okay, this teacher says the history of his art is this, this one says this, this one says this, but here's the historical perspective separate from that chapter on the arts in general in the Philippines using anthropology and sociology as a background for drawing the information. And uh, based on the 172 references, most of them published in the Philippines that are in the bibliography in the back for people to check. And the, the histories didn't jive sometimes, so the guys, the masses were getting called out on their fake stories. <laughs> Uh, so I think something like that happened with um, the late Master Lazo, and he didn't like being uh, giving credit for giving me some information that maybe wasn't accurate, or maybe it was accurate, but 
other he wasn't supposed to tell me I, I don't know I well, because he didn't he never called me and said I'm mad because of this and then mm -hmm. I think in one of the Filipino martial arts magazine or something he said oh because I had said there's no such thing as Kali is not really an art that originated in the Philippines it's Los Angeles based and he and and I and the whole thing with Kali is tied to being this kind of mother art of the Philippines and all Arts of Arnis, Eskrima, Kabarawan, Sikaran, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, Panatukan, all fall under the umbrella of Kali. And that they was taught in these schools in the ancient days called the Botuan, and mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Well, of course, if you take the whole, my teacher said this and my teacher said that out of the equation, and just look at the anthropological and the folklore record in the Philippines, there was no martial arts being taught in these Botuan schools. I mean, and, and with 73 or something ethno-linguistic groups with different languages mm -hmm. in, the, in the island, and they're only joined together because Magellan came and said, I claim this many islands that I can see right. and call it the Philippines. It wasn't like one United Nation. It was a bunch of islands with different ethno-linguistic or what you call tribal groups speaking mm -hmm. different languages. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and all of a sudden became the same. They had different cooking, different music, different religions different belief systems. There's no way they all had one martial art, though. Right. I mean, the whole idea is crazy. And there's there's nobody, there's nothing in the literature over there talking about Kali. And nothing at all. Um, it's all over here since the 80s, you know. And a lot of the guys who are teaching Kali, a lot of the older masters who are claiming to teach Kali um, now used to call it Arnis or Eskrima in the 70s and early 80s. Mm -hmm. um, and they're and their master certificates or grandmaster certificates from the Philippines say of Scream and Arnis, and I have Xeroxes of them in my archives. Um, and I, you know, cross reference. <laughs> so, anyway, um, <laughs> so Fred Laza was, was complaining that I said there's no, this thing isn't true. And then Fred Laza was saying uh, in this magazine article that just because, so there's a book called Maragtas that came out in the Philippines, which is a translation or an oral, okay, it was written during the Spanish occupation, and then somebody this century in the 40s or something, I, I'm forgetting the dates off the top of my head, um, took the oral tradition from Maragtas and wrote it in, in Spanish or English, I think Spanish, and then we translated it to English, right? So, of course, we're all looking at whoever was doing research. I, I have a copy of it here in Spanish and English. Uh, at Maragtas, you see the Botoan, right, and whatever. Right. But they can't find the original source anywhere from where it came. The anthropologist, the folklorist, the sociologist, it's not in their pantheon of information. It's not in their canon of information. So they dismiss it as folklore and recreated history by certain um, uh, groups within the Philippines, like Ilocanos, Visayas, where they're trying to get a superior position, jockeying for position culturally within the identity of what is a Filipino and what is the Philippines. Right. So taking martial arts out of the picture completely, they're having they're struggling with that document anyway. And there's no original source that they can find. So it's oral tradition handed down, then rewritten, then revised. And then this is and then you get somebody throwing martial arts into the picture. And right. then we derive this that must be the mother art, you know, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, down the line. So um so much uh, yeah. So anyway, so Fred was upset with that, Fred Lazo, and was saying in this article that just because, you know, the original check doesn't exist doesn't mean that there's not a Xerox copy of the check, so therefore I'm wrong. And I'm like, well, it's not me. I'm just, I'm not, I don't care if there's Kali or not Kali. I'm, I was just going to the Philippines to find Kali masters, Arnis masters, and Eskrima masters and find out what the heck's the difference. Right. Because how come all these guys who are doing Kali and Arnis and Eskrima all looks the same? Like, right. Stylistic things aside, inside block looks like inside block, whether you do an inside block serrata or an inside sweep, you know, or an inside wall defense or, you know, come on, right? By all an umbrella, it's still... It's an umbrella, it's an umbrella, umbrella, right? We all have the same disarm, we're all using angles of attack, I mean, right. really. And I and I was so conflicted, like, where is that? I can't wait, I'm going to go to Mindanao with the original art. And if I, well, I found Silat and some Silat teachers who were doing Malaysian or Indonesian Silat and amongst those communities, but and Filipinos who are studying with them, okay. just like, you know, I'm an American who did a Filipino art, you know, they're Filipinos doing a Malay art. Right. But there's no authentic, traditional, indigenous Filipino silat. Uh -huh. It was brought over from the 
from the uh, peoples of Malaysia. And then there's all kinds of Arnis in Mindanao. I met so I met I went to the Arnis Association headquarters. Uh, the Sen- the congressman at the time is now Senator Miguel Zubiri. Mm-hmm. Uh, I stayed at his home and he took me around to meet these people there. Uh, Miguel was best man at my wedding also. Um, and um, you know, wow, I'm in Mindanao at, at an Arnis school. <laughs> I'm in Mindanao in an Escrima master's house. Right. Where's the Kali? What's Kali? Oh, oh, okay, I know. American Arnis. Okay, uh-huh. you guys are from America. Uh-huh. Got it. Uh-huh. Got it. And then, like, even Illustrissimo, I say, you know, Tatang, how come your artist Kali Illustrissimo? He said, no, it's not Kali Illustrissimo. I said, what is it? He said, if you play with a stick, it's Oli- an Olissi as a stick, right? right? So he said, I use Olissi Sistrissimo. Olissi Sistrissimo. Escrima. When we play with the sword, my sword that I like is the Kalis or the Cutlass. Uh-huh. Sword, I call it Kalis Illustrissimo. You play it stick, Illustrissimo Escrima. You play sword, Kalis Illustrissimo. There's no Kali. That's n- we're not calling the art Kali. We're describing what we're training with. Sure. Right. And I said okay. And then there was no one else in the Philippines doing Kali except Leo Gahe. Um, you know. And now there's some Sayak groups there, but there weren't at the time that that I saw. You know. And and. You know, Leo and I had a nice hour and a half phone call last night. I, I called him in in um, Bacolod in Negros Occidental in the Philippines. We chatted for an hour and a half. He's, mm-hmm. He uh, sent me photographs for the disarming book after he told me he doesn't do disarming because he just cut you and kill you. But please take the photographs and use them <laughs> for me disarming. <laughs> so I was very, I was very, yeah, I was very honored uh, that he's now my friend because he had challenged me to a knife fight to the death uh, at a seminar before. And now we're now we're good friends. But um, because he didn't like that, I said there's no Kali because after all he's the grandmaster, you know. Sure. So anyway, so Kali, I, yeah, you could. So I, I look at it this way now. I say yes, of course there's Kali because that's the name of the art that these guys want to call their art, right? right. If you want to call a Kali, you can call a Kali. You can call it Kabarawan or Anis or Screma or Kung Fu or uh, call it fist fist way. I don't care. Sure. Sure. But. The the problem I have is when you was when they make the claims that it's the mother art of the Philippines, that all other Filipino arts fall under that umbrella. There's not even a even the national language of the Philippines, which is now Tagalog and used to be Spanish. Mm-hmm. Even the national language is not spoken by all Filipinos. You know, everybody there speaks. Oh, I speak Ilocano, Tagalog, and Visayan. Mm-hmm. You know, because if you go 20 miles, they don't speak. Tagalog, they don't speak Visayan. Right. You have to know their dialect if you grow up in that area, you know. And if there's not one language or one cooking system or one religion, how can there be one martial art? It's imp- the one original martial art. It's impossible because not, there's not one original ethno-linguistic group that makes up the Filipino. It is impossible that there's just so happens to be one all-encompassing, super highly developed uh, fighting art that has all these elements to it. And uh, and it's not there. It's not there. As so, someone, Mark, and, and I'm sorry, I didn't mean to uh, get okay. off of that thought. As someone, though, who has come from a uh, similar background, or uh, as you and I have in the uh, Taekwondo, Hapkido, right. the traditional Korean background, right. uh, and how the influence, let's say, uh, of moving into a one Korean art of Taekwondo, so right. that it can be quote unquote Olympic specific right. sport art. Right. right. And how they manipulated those particular systems that were right. around at that time, whether it be Mi Kwan, An Kwan, whatever right. it may be, into one quote unquote Olympic sure. qualifying system. In the same way, do you think that the way the uh, Philippine, uh, the Philippines are utilizing our niece in the same way in a sport fashion in order to draw uh, more attraction to that and to yeah. have more of a sport influence so that our niece can be a, uh, an Olympic sport someday as it is a uh, Southeast Asian sport right now? Right. Mm-hmm. Games. Do you feel that that can somewhat dilute what happens uh, on the floor um, in a realistic sense? 
Yeah, yeah and we, we, we saw that too in, in China during the Cultural Revolution when all the traditional Kung Fu had to merge to Wushu mm -hmm. or be banished or stop mm -hmm. teaching. A lot of the guys you know, moved to Taiwan, Hong Kong, Southeast Asia, Philippines, Malaysia. A lot of the traditional Kung Fu because the government tried to make a one art, a national art, Guoshu, right? Right. Uh, and the Philippines are trying to promote, you know, Remy Presas was instrumental in the 70s under President Marcos to get our niece put into the physical education system uh, in the Philippine school systems. Um, and um, modern our niece was developed for that purpose. And it was taught in 12, 12 steps or 12 lessons mm -hmm. in the PE curriculum. Mm -hmm. And there's actually a book out uh, in the Philippines called Modern Ernest and 12 Easy Lessons. <laughs> really? Right. Yeah. So Modern Ernest was, was uh, because before it was just Presas style Ernest, you know, or just Ernest before they were labeling it the names, you know. Um, but the art, uh, the so called, the, the naming of it as Modern Ernest was to bring it into a physical education piece where they could promote a national art, get it into schools, have people doing things other than basketball. And, you know, in the, in their school, they could do something traditional for mm -hmm. their own culture. Mm -hmm. And and the modern Ernest was developed and its techniques developed like a plain vanilla system. So what we get over here as modern Ernest earlier on was that plain vanilla system that Remy used to say it's the art within your art. Like, this is so plain you know, you don't have to do any cross-legged stances, weird posturing. You don't have to learn these complicated, you know, disarms and, and swords and all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. You can take this art and, and have it be the weapon art expression within your own Taekwondo, Hakido, Kempo, Karate, mm -hmm. Jiu-Jitsu, mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. What a masterful way of planting the art, you know, getting people interested. Right. Um, and then later Remy came out with more different things, you know, because the art, the interest in the art itself was there, not just as an adjunct, right. you know. Um, but so the Philippines, they've been trying to do that, and they're trying to get it into the Olympics, and the national sport, I think, is Taekwondo in the Philippines, registered as a national sport, and basketball. It's really kind of disturbing. Um, and I think that they're, they're doing the tournaments. I think the tournaments are okay. Uh, I just hope they don't lose the essence of the individual styles in favor of just the tournament competition. Um, but, you know... Uh, most of the guys in the Philippines call their art Arnis anyway. Um, only, only some of the, the Cebuano teachers use the word Escrima, mm -hmm. but mostly everybody else is using the word Arnis. Uh, just everyone's different expression. It, what's interesting, I, I found uh, to come to realize when I was trying to, you know, in our background with, the, with Korean arts, especially with Chinese arts or Japanese, I lived in Japan for a bit, uh, everything is based, is based in the lineage, you know. I'm um, 300, you know, uh, 300 generations, uh, 300 years, a thousand years of, you know, the five ancestor fist or Wing Chun, sure. or, you know, Choi Li Futs or the Shaolin. Can you trace your art back to Shaolin? Mm -hmm. You know, and it's it's all about the lineage. You know, I'm I'm with this teacher who got from this teacher who learned from this teacher. In the Philippines, boy, I couldn't find more than one teacher back past any of the old grandmasters that I met. So I go Angel Cabalas to Felicissimo di San to uh, pause. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. I go Antonio Illustrissimo back to Pedro Cortez and his family. Pause. Wait, wait, wait. Can't get any more information from anyone. You go, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Leo Leo Gahe and Gerson Tortal back to Conrado Tortal and then, mm -hmm. uh, well, we'll just tack on some more family members, but nobody else can corroborate it. Remy and his brother and Ernesto Preso back to their father, pause, but they actually had additional instructors uh, there that they didn't give credit to. Um, that I did corroborate. But so the, so the Filipino arts, I realized, okay, why do all these styles, you can't trace them back? You know, they're, everybody's, and so they're not carrying forth histories then. Right. Right? They're, they're carrying forth the art and the expression of the art, and the art is alive in that way. But they're not carrying, so they're not, they don't have, like in, like in Chinese Buddhist culture, a ancestor worship idea, right. you know. So there's no kind of ancestral worship or ancestral ma maintenance of the Arnese masters mm -hmm. past mm -hmm. their own instructor. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it's very difficult, especially, you know, to get what is the actual history of where this came and developed. Because 
there's no oral tradition being passed on except for what they're reading in the books, you know, or 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 what they could remember that was being passed down through the right. teachers. Right. But there's, but you can hardly trace anybody past one, one or two generations, you know, um, you know. So I really feel for like when Dan Asano was writing his book, I mean, he talked about Kali and he talked about you know, these different histories and things and mm-hmm. the Moros and the Cortamentados and all these things and and it's like, wow, there must have been you know, he was a history major too, you know, he was a history teacher, so he had access to those books, but he didn't have access to the books inside the Philippines really. At the, there was no Amazon dot com. <laughs> you know <laughs> you know you know what I'm saying? Yes, I and and he hadn't been to the Philippines when he you know, and it so he wasn't going through the archives of the universities there or sure. through the old book second hand bookshops or sure. or whatever, you know. And so some of this stuff at the time was the oral tradition handed to him from the teachers that are in his book. And of, and of course, you know, that's, that's his information. But they, there's not much past them. Maybe one teacher passed each of those. Mm-hmm. So when I went to the Philippines, I found the same thing. It's like, wow, how do you corroborate a lot of this stuff? You have to start meeting people who knew people right. at the same time and match it against the information in the, in the anthropology and sociology and folklore books and texts that have actually been documenting this stuff since before the Spanish were there. Mm-hmm. You know, and the martial arts are mentioned here and there in those books um, in the context of development with the rest of the culture. But trying to find the individual system, like, oh, Serrata gener- you know, originated in this town for 1,500 years, well, you can't find that. Right. So what's more important is that the art is dynamic and living and alive and being passed on and so many teachers add their name to it. Kalis Illustrisimo, Kabala Serrata, Binya Sarnis, like La Costa System, right? Villa Bria, La Gusa Kali, right? Everybody puts their name because of all the 50 teachers, uh, you know, training and teaching out in the public in the Philippines, maybe three or four will rise to the top and get and get the notoriety and respect of their peers. And then, oh, I train with Tatang Illustrisimo, okay. So, oh, you do the Illustrisimo System, okay. And that's where then the names start coming up and, and and, and uh, self-generating, you know, sure. lasting, and the other ones just drop off. Sure. Uh, but now with the internet, everybody can put up their own style and have it and have it documented. Exactly. exactly. You know, yeah. but you the know, history it's, it's, is. You know, it's interesting in the research, uh, <clears throat> as you were saying, that is the history uh, and the historical content as far as it being written right. goes so far. I have had a conversation, a similar conversation, with someone who had uh, authored a book. Um, Regarding uh, Siwat, uh, people on Jamindi, uh, I believe the system was, and that was uh, uh, Pendikar uh, William Sanders. Right. And, uh, you know, he was describing essentially the same process that, that he had gone through when he had gone to research uh, uh, the Siwat system that he was researching at the time. So, you know, I can, I can certainly appreciate, uh, you know, the, the effort that it takes to trace that back, but, but at the same time, when an instructor um, such as Grandmaster Angel or uh, Grandmaster Illustrisimo may say, well, you know, it, it, it's a system, or as I've often heard from uh, from uh, Grandmaster Roni Frasis, a student uh, in uh, uh, Dan Anderson or Tim Hartman, whoever it was I spoke with, that they would often say, well, you know, he, he would tell them to make the system their own. Right. And, and so, in doing that, I, I see that what you need in keeping the art alive uh, being uh, more important uh, immediately or, or at that time as opposed to uh, keeping the historical content or, uh, right. or uh, ancestor uh, ancestry alive. Right. So, I'd like, so, to make another parallel with Chinese systems, and this is an important one for me in my own study because I also am a long, you know, 30-year practitioner of Kung Fu, sure. the, the, and, and the difference between that and Eskrima or Nis. Um, so in the Kung Fu styles, in the Chinese styles, there's this lineage, right? And this ancestor worship of your lineage. You know, I come from this style of this master of this lineage. Right. And you have these forms that are passed down. Mm-hmm. And then people, you know, in different lineages under the same style will mock each other's hand position, you know, even though they're doing the same art, right? Of course. It's like the Serrata, right? Of course. And, um, but you have something to base your training on that's been documented for 
three hundred years, there might be ten or fifteen books or a hundred books on the style. Mm-hmm. You know, it's some documented footage going back to the twenties or thirties. Um, and you have oral traditions in the in the Chinese arts. You have these poems and chung kit or the uh, the keyword phrases and maxims sure. that help lead your training and lead the application. Even though, you know, you, not all the students learn them or know them. You know, but they're there and they're documented and they help you kind of guide the application of the art or the training of the art. Kind of interesting. But what the Chinese have lost is that kind of free flow application because they have two man drills that are prearranged. We have two man drills in the Filipino arts that are not prearranged. You right. know, we start out maybe with a box pattern, flow sparring, and then you right. add in another angle and another angle. But then you just go free. So you get this kind of natural movement for your own body personality and type, you know. Uh-huh. Um, but what we lose in the Philippine arts, I think, um, with not having the kind of the written documentation, what are what are the, the, the key words here, what are the key phrases, what are the strategies and maxims and sayings that inform our stuff, what is it what does a good inside block look like and do we have something to measure it against? Mm-hmm. You know? You know that when you build a room, you okay, four walls, a roof, and it should be 90 degree angle at every corner, you know, at every connecting point. Right. You know, um, but do, we don't have that in a written down over generations in the Filipino arts at all. It's it's just taught out inside block, right? Outside block, cross, and then right. people might explain it, but they're not following the same set of rules as a foundation baseline for a technique. Mm-hmm. And therefore, even within the same art, then, we're all making it our own, but who says we know enough about it to do it properly? Right. Whereas the Chinese can do it properly, the Chinese systems, but they don't really make it their own. So what I try to do with this disarming book is say, okay, here's all the variations, because here's all the teachers doing their disarming, Mm -hmm. but I'm going to lay out the framework conceptually for what does a good disarm look like, strategically, position-wise, trajectory, et cetera, et cetera, teach that in a generic way, and then let the masters do the techniques and speak their own, on their own expression of those, art, of those disarms. But to do, to do what a lot of people don't know or don't uh, talk about a lot in, our, in the screma is that techniques are range-specific, because mostly everybody does their techniques in medium range. And they think because you can do uh, what Angel called a shoulder block or with a little bigger stick, you might call it a wing or something, right? right. right? Uh, that because we can do it in close range, it should be done in medium range. Or maybe I can do it as I, fa- as I zone out into long range, you know? Right. But no, you know what? The technique is not meant, the structure of the technique anatomically cannot up- withhold the pressure and the weight of a blow at that range with that structure of the weapon. You have to use a different technique, mm-hmm. and so the rain, the techniques are really. And I learned this going through the Philippines, talking with all these masters. I didn't know it until I put it all, put it together, and was interviewing them. Mm-hmm. And I realized that that each technique has a range in which it works, and most techniques can work in more than one range, but not necessarily all three ranges. But when you use it in a different range, they usually have a different light forward because of the anatomical structure that makes it strong enough to use in that other range. Or they have a different footwork for getting into the position to do it. And over here in the United States and, and most of the, uh, even in the Philippines, they're not really talking about these things in part of the lesson plan. You know, because everybody's just making it their own and they don't have that kind of... Um, concept. The, the concept. to The concept of verbally teaching their art or thinking that you have to pass on that material because the application in the moment is what they're focused on. And the application in the moment changes. Okay, here's an example. On I was in the training with Antonio Illustrissimo with Tatang in the park, and a gentleman from England was there videotaping for me. And I was learning, he was teaching me this technique called pluma, which is like a shoulder block or a wing. Okay. But pluma is done, you start in medium range, and you can stay in medium range, or you can go start at medium range and go into close range. But you can't do it in long range, of course. Um, but I didn't know, of course, at the time. So I'm feeding, so Tatang says, okay, strike me. So I give him angle one. He does pluma technique. And he does it again and again. And he says, okay, now you do it. And he sits down and ha- has a student give me a one. 
and I do it, and he goes, wrong, and I do it again, and wrong, I do it again, wrong, and he gets up, and he says, strike again, and I strike, and he does it differently. And I said, well, you didn't, okay, let me just do it again and not be ignorant, maybe I didn't see it. Uh -huh. So I give him the, another angle one, and he does it almost the same, but differently again. And then he sat down, and I did it wrong ten more times, of course, right? And then he did it again, and I struck him, and he did it wrong, and I said, excuse me, Tatang, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I, I, I'm just copying exactly what you're showing me. He goes, no, you're not. I said, yes, I am. He said, no, which time? And I'm like, right, which time? Like, what, which one do you want me to do? Right. He said, it depends on how you strike. He said, the first time you strike me, you step forward with your right leg and did angle one. I said, yeah, that's angle one. He said, but the next time you stood still and gave me angle one. I said, because I was watching you. I was trying not to worry about myself. He goes, right, but your force was different and the angle was different and the intention was different. And then you gave me angle one again, your left leg was forward. So of course I can't do pluma the same all times because you gave me a different strike every time. So you have to learn from me, he said, you have to learn from me the experience of the technique. Because I can't tell you the exact way to do it because it changes with, depending on what range we're in. And when you stand still and strike me, we're essentially in long range. Right. And when you step forward and strike me, we're in medium range. But when you step forward with your left leg and strike, I'm essentially in close range because now your left hand is, too, is very close to me, I'm not, even though the right hand is in medium range. So I have to do it differently and still be covered. Man was a genius. <laughs> so I realized that without having that kind of poem or maxims for this is pluma, this is shoulder flag, this is what it means, this is how it can be varied, you know. And there's some rules to follow. Because obviously he had the rules, he was telling me them, but he couldn't tell them to me until I did something goofy, and then he could tell me why he did it that way. So I wrote it all, I wrote it all down, you know. Cool. And then I did the same thing with all the other teachers. I said, oh, how come, wow, when I strike you in angle three and you do your disarm, no problem, but I strike you angle three with my other leg forward, you can't get the disarm. Wow, the body dynamic is different. But, over, but most people are just doing inside block, angle one, you know, uh, vine, quick release on angle three, whatever. Right. And they're not thinking about the rules. Or, are there rules? You know, they don't think there are rules. But really, there are rules inherent in the system. They're just not written down. And, and unless you had somebody, like I was fortunate that Tong Tong explained that to me, and then I could use that as a, as a kind of launching off point for my training with the other teachers, to sit there and kind of probe toward that, toward that end to get the answers, you know, and um, and then so I put that I th that information into the disarming book, okay, and so it's actually out outlined in the disarming book specific to disarms, but it's there that you can apply to any other of course, of course. blocking double stick a spotty dog or whatever, right. but the whole idea of that is uh, is now in the disarming book, so. But, and that's really where I think like the essence of the art is in the concepts and principles and not just in the how many techniques can you do because they're just examples of concepts and principles, right? Right. So, so you can do... the extension do, of that, they're the actually the physical extension of those. Right, things. right. So chicken parmesan is the extension of the raw chicken, right? Right. Right. <laughs> right. But you can make it up any way you want, right? And uh, if you have the chicken and sauce, but no cheese, it's not Parmesan anymore, oh, even, though like <laughs> even though it looks like it, right? Exactly. Or chicken with melted provolone on a roll, it's, it's still missing the ingredient of what is a Parmesan. Exactly. So what, what make, so, but we know how to measure a Parmesan, right? We know what it is. And, and there's bad tasting and really good tasting, but that's just levels of quality. But at least we can identify what is a Parmesan versus a, a piccata, you know, or whatever. Right. And it seems in the Filipino art that kind of documenting is, has not been there because these guys have just been defending themselves and using it for fighting and not writing books and mm -hmm. passing it on orally. And, you know, you get a lot of, a lot of guys in the class who aren't, who aren't intellectual, you know, or don't have time to think that way or it's just a hobby right. or they don't write it down and, it, and they don't have any students so it doesn't go anywhere. Right. So it's hard to... Um, uh, to come to that, but hopefully, hopefully people start thinking in those ways, and then we won't argue over who's got the best art, you know, yeah. because it's all the same concepts that we're all working with. We just don't really, we don't all agree that those are there yet, <laughs> right? In the in the passing in the passing of time, whether it be five years, ten years, fifteen, yeah. twenty, whatever the case may be, 
what is what is it do you feel? Where where do you feel that that your niche will have been, uh, has been, and, and what contribution do you feel you and, and, and what you do will, <coughs> will be within the Filipino martial arts as a whole? And as a system, as you teach the way that you teach, where do you feel um, that is going to progress to? Wow. Um, hmm. I know there's a lot there. <laughs> there's a lot there, and and I, some of them could be answered by by some of my contemporaries, maybe. <laughs> I um, I think I think that well, what I would like ideally, <laughs> who knows how it's going to turn out, is that that people will, I, and and a lot of people do, uh, will appreciate the effort that I put forward not to just promote myself or my art, but to promote the Filipino arts in a global perspective, in a pan-Philippine perspective, you know, to give, I, I felt like after, you know, after 1994, none of the other magazine articles, I wrote 300, I had 300 martial art articles in the magazines, Inside Kung Fu Black Belt, whatever, and, and um, five books, uh, on a screamer, uh, but 10 overall in martial arts. And after 1994, none of them, no article or book focused on me as the teacher or the head or the expert. Every single, aside from a, a couple of articles, you know, a good 279, 80 of them focused on culture, the art in general, or other older masters, mm -hmm. um, you know. Um, and the books focused on their arts and their histories and their contributions because I felt, you know what, in time, my time will come. I'm still young, you know. These guys are old, can't make a living, and their art is dying, and nobody knows this information. Mm -hmm. And so I feel that I've accomplished that task of promoting. And so I wanted to be like the Don Dreger. Of the, you know, he wrote this book on Indonesian fighting yes. arts that was just spectacular. And he did a general one with Robert Smith on Asian fighting arts. And then he did some, you know, Budo and Bujitsu books. And I have right. the whole collection, you know. Right. That. And, um, you know, he wasn't writing about himself or only about his own lineage. He was writing about, you know, Judo and Kenjutsu and, and mm -hmm. all kinds of Silat. And, and I thought, man, nobody's got... And he had been to the Philippines three times and didn't write about it. He just wrote a little article in an Asian fighting arts book with Robert Smith, like a couple pages. Mm -hmm. And I was like, man, somebody's, you know, so I wanted to kind of, um, you know, be like the Don Dreger, you know, and the Robert Smith for the Chinese boxing, you know, mm -hmm. of, of, of documenting these systems in the Philippines and, and getting these older masters arts on the table because I know I was over here waiting for the next issue of Inside Kung Fu or Black Belt to see if there was an article out, right. just like you, running to, the, you know, 300 miles to the next seminar of whoever's out doing something and not knowing what's the difference between this art and that art and who's this and what's that and what's the history of this and where's that and what is anting anting on oration and do you have to believe in those to, to do our knees and mm -hmm. wait a minute all, most of the Filipinos are Catholic but all this stuff is supposed to be Muslim and how come the guys doing Kali are Catholic wait a minute I'm all confused here you know so and uh, after the books came out you know a lot more people got involved in Serata. People found out about Illustrisimo's art and the Venus system and, and some of the other arts that I wrote about. And these guys actually got people flying into the Philippines to train with them. And they got to earn a living a little bit before they passed away and get their art documented and, and, uh, and so forth. And I hope people will stop bickering because their one teacher wasn't in, in one of my books. <laughs> or because it's because I didn't have a million dollars to pay to fly it to everybody's house, you know, sure. and that you know, and they will realize that all this time that they're promoting themselves as their as a master or a grandmaster or with their students or p putting a name out that what they've been yelling at me for I haven't been doing, you know, mm -hmm. I haven't been using all of that to put myself on a pedestal or to say I, I I'm better or have more. I've just been promoting those arts. It's, they're bringing their own insecurities into it. So I hope. My hope is that that negativity will fall away, and more of the appreciation will come forth from those people because, you know, 20,000 people bought Filipino martial culture and they appreciate it. You know, although one writer in the Manila Times in the Manila, when the book came out, called me a carpetbagger. 
He said he just, like it, like all the Western explorers who came before him, Wiley has come in and stolen our national treasure and taken it out of the country. I said, yeah, I packed up every grandmaster and brought him to Philadelphia, and, and you guys have nothing, you know. Thanks. <laughs> so I just laughed. Uh, but I hope that contribution will be there, and even the disarming book. I'm teaching disarms in it, but the majority of the book, I mean, what other technique book in any martial art has masters and grandmasters who have passed away and are old now and, and of 25 different styles within that art realm all in the same book right, right. you know so I, I you know I just really just love the art so much I just want to keep promoting it and promoting the teachers and I'm you know sorry if whoever doesn't like the history or this or that part you know it sucks to only believe that there's one truth right Sure. And uh, you got to open your mind, and and or forget about it. Just say I just care about the uh, the fighting part. That's good too. Right. You know, um, I'd like to do more more teaching in the years to come. Uh, I have a, you know four or five groups, uh, Singapore and, and London and uh, Philadelphia and Los Angeles. But you know we keep it small. We keep it quiet. And uh, as I can, as my kids are getting older and. Le- my son is 13 and <laughs> would rather spend time with his friends when my daughter gets a little bit older too and right. I, I could have more time on purpose I don't do many seminars only a couple a year four or five a year because I just don't like to travel away right. I like to be here for my kids and, um, you know I'm a single father so I, I, I watch them on my own and uh, you know and, and work so I'm hoping that the uh, that during this time that I'm not out there active on the scene so to speak I am here teaching if anybody wants to come in and train or set you know and, and learn some learn some concepts they don't have to learn my art but I can teach them concepts that are that are general to the Filipino arts and it can help their arts uh, but if they want to learn my method that's great too uh, and how uh, would they and how would a prospective student or someone who may be interested have to listen to our conversation this evening how would they get in touch with you? How, do you have a website? Do you have uh, do you have instructional videos or uh, that type of thing that they can get, uh, get a hold of? And um, um, no, I'm on Facebook. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like everyone else. Uh-huh. And my website, uh, which is integratedescrema.com, uh-huh. is currently down because we're we are redeveloping it to put up clips. I've I've been transferring. I think I transferred 90 VHS recordings from my travels onto DVD oh, wow. and, I'm pull, and I'm pulling out clips of, of me training with some of my teachers, you know, with Angel and with sure. Vinyas and Illustrissimo and different people and putting those clips up and then just clips I have of all these different teachers. I'm going to try and start uploading that as a resource rather than selling the DVDs uh-huh. that two people buy and copy for everyone anyway. Sure. I might as well uh, put it out there maybe as a as a member section if you buy the disarming book you can see the disarming videos of these teachers oh, for free you know I don't know I'm, I'm working on that concept and, and figuring out how to get this information out there I hate that I have so many interviews and so many thousands of photos in my basement not just on our knees but I have an entire book on Salam bomb Indian staff fighting really? I trained with uh, Don Dreger's master in Malaysia three times and we did a book together and I can't find a publisher for it Oh no! Even though I've got very good sales for martial art books, nobody's so interested. Are are you? And somewhat of a personal question: Are, yeah. are you uh, are are you limited, uh, contracted to a particular publishing company, or is this No, I can go with anybody. Right. And you know, the um, yeah, you know, I can send it to anybody. And I and I wrote, you know, I, I've got so I just got I, I was doing a book on Sea Lot in Malaysia, and I've got five or six C-Lot systems and masters in it and nobody wanted to publish it. Uh, all this stuff is sitting in my archives in my basement. All this video footage, I was doing a book on traditional healers. At the same time that I was studying martial arts overseas, I was doing interviews and training and receiving sessions and lessons at the hands of bone setters and shaman and monkey healer um, uh, herbalists in Malaysia, wow. uh, Philippines, Singapore, Taiwan, uh, Japan. And I took photographs and videos and interviews just like I was doing with the martial arts. Nice. And I cannot find a publisher for 15 years. Wow. And it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. I was so happy to see recently that um, uh, Virgil Apostle wrote a book on Filipino healers. Uh-huh. Um, and he published it on Amazon.com. And, and 
you know, I have a bunch that were published in the Philippines, probably 10 or 12, sure. on the psychic surgeons or on whatever. And, right. and I spent so much time with so many healers over there and have all these tremendous photographs of these guys and their rituals and doing healing on people. And I, I, it's just, so my hope is that more and more of this depth of research that I was very, feel so fortunate to have gotten and the opportunities that I'll be able to find some way to release the information, um, you know, uh, for more people to benefit from it. It doesn't do me any, it doesn't do, I already got the benefit from it, so it doesn't do me any net benefit to just hide it in my basement, you know, and I would really love to share more, and, uh, you know, I, 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 yeah, I wish there was, you know, I wish there was more cooperation in the Filipino martial arts community here in the United States, where there, people would actually come together and say, hey, you know what, Mark, you're doing a great job, or we have other writers, too, who are doing a good job, who have information, and we all have these archives of photos in our own homes, you know, um, people who train with different teachers and took photos and all. Let's, let's all throw in, you know, 100 bucks each, everybody, and collaborate, and let's do a, a, a huge book together or a series right. of books or documentaries or, or, or slideshows, sure. you know, on Flash, you know, with photographs. And just at the bottom of the photos, you can put the credit to whose it was. But right. you, can you imagine that there's probably 7,000 photos of Angel Cabalas from all his students in Stockton and around the country, and Leo Hiron and Max Sarmiento and Dentoy and Danny and on and on and on, just in this country, just the teachers in this country. And have everybody could do a chapter and just say, this is my remembrance of the, of the three things that I remember that, that were spectacular when I trained with Angel. His sure. red high tops, his, his, his whatever, you know, I don't, I don't know, right. what, his garlic chicken, whatever you want right. to say, or the way he taught me inside block against angle six. Right. And do like a little page about it. Tell a little story and then have your photos there. Absolutely. And then the next guy and the next student and the next student and I'll collaborate on something instead of waiting for me to do it and then yelling because I didn't include everybody. You know, it's kind of crazy. I agree. I agree. So if we can, if some people are interested and they want to get together, let's do it. You know, Anthony Davis said to me today he wants to collaborate. Great, let's do it. Dan, Dan Anderson and I are going to collaborate on more things. He's, I'm a special guest at a modern art East training camp out here in July in Philly. Dan's flying out, Tim Hartman, all kinds of people. And Dan and I are going to collaborate on something, probably a video or something. Um, and... Um, Oh, you know, yeah, Darren Tibone and I were talking last night about collaborating on something, mm-hmm. and um, I, you know, my my big wish is that I, you know Dan and Asano would somehow want to collaborate with me on something, just an article, an interview, um, a book, or, or just a conversation. It would just, you know, um, a lot of people are around him, and a lot of people have been training with him. I trained with him in the '80s. Sure. Seminar-wise, I was never a personal student, you know. Right. But they don't appreciate all that he ha- I mean, they, they love him and they appreciate him as their guru, you know. Sure. But they don't really, because of all this background I have of information from my research, I really appreciate what he's brought to the table and what he did in the 70s. I'm sure he got a lot of flack from his book and from teaching all different styles, you know, right. which is probably why he's less. He hasn't been, he, you know, he doesn't write magazine articles for 20 years, you know. Uh-huh. Um and stuff and his books are out of print doesn't doesn't re-release them or write new ones I'm sure if he got the backlash like I've got I'm sure he, he just didn't want to do it uh, but I would just you know I appreciate what he's got and what he has to offer and if ever the opportunity were there you know his daughter Diana Diana and her and her husband Ron are, are both in my disarming book and uh, which I'm so I get to at least have you know that system in there of course you know and in Filipino fighting arts book where I had different styles, I had Chris Kent, one of his earlier students, doing the photos, um, to, so I could represent that style as well. But you know, to have to to be able to just really have a heart to heart and long conversation with him, and not about who's right, who's wrong, what's this, and just but like, hey, what was this, and how was that, and what do you think about this, and what, you know, that would be a big thing for me, right, uh, right, right, personally, even if nothing comes out of it, publish wise, publishing wise, right, right. Um, but he's the only teacher that I don't have really access to. Uh, on purpose, they're keeping me, you know, the powers that be. When I show up at a seminar, they ask, they kind of circumvent me whenever Dan's near me. They pull him over to the other side of the room and ask questions, you know, really? so that he so that he doesn't come over and talk. And 
it's kind of weird. You know, Christopher Ricketts and Edgar Soliti were all very close friends of mine and would say, you know, talk to Mark and say, well, I don't know, you know, talk to Paula. <laughs> I, I don't know what what the deal is because I never got in, I never I never got the, the reasoning. But I see. Um, anyway, be that as may, you're asking me what do I want from the future? What do I think? Yes. Um, I think I'll be known more as a writer than a teacher. Although I I have a lot to teach that people aren't teaching. Mm-hmm. Um, it's concept wise, not technique wise, mm-hmm. but understanding of the technique and and just a personal thing. I would like to have a long you know have be able to interview Dan. Like like we're talking here tonight, you know. So. So long story short, basically, you see yourself more as a historian. Uh, yeah, a cultural well, historian for the a, art. A cultural historian, yes, for the art. Yeah. As well as, of course, uh, an instructor uh, as well. Yeah. Definitely, you know, an instructor, but I don't have huge group or huge association because the focus is for me for the last, you know, 15 or 20, 15 years at least has been on promoting the art. And the, other, and the older masters and not focusing on me and my system or my teaching or my association. So a lot of people call me uh, and email me and ask, do you know any teachers in uh, Philadelphia? It's like, well, yeah, I live here. Yeah, but, yeah, but who's teaching? <laughs> I was like, well, I have a class on Saturday in Northeast Philly. Yeah, okay, but what master's teaching there? It's like, really? Wow. Because I don't write about myself? You don't think I'm, wow. I'm a qualified teacher? And then... I'll I'll do something and they'll be like, wow, you know, not bad, you know, and uh, whatever. And then, okay, well, who do you know in New York I can go train with? I said, really? And and uh, somebody said to me a couple of years ago, um, a, a Tai Chi teacher said, you know, Mark, I think the the problem is that they all look at you as the historian and not as the master. Right. <laughs> so I said, well, okay, so that's my role. There it is. You Outstanding, know? Mark. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. I Thank you, Michael. Your, I appreciate your time and your patience and, uh, and your energy. You have so much knowledge. It's been uh, such a wonderful, wonderful experience. Uh, I hope that uh, hope that in the very near future that uh, we'll have an opportunity to uh, to work together or collaborate in some fashion uh, within the next year or so. I hope so. I look forward to it, and, and I really. Um I admire what you're doing it as well, what you're doing here as well with these interview series. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of effort. People can just click and listen, but they don't realize <laughs> all that goes into setting these things up and the fact that you're even doing this at, you know, with no cost, no no money, you know, whatever costs are involved, you're taking them on your own. And Well, the, the much like yourself, I have a love for the art. All right. Uh, and, uh, and I do, I do appreciate uh, uh, other systems, not uh, although my system that, that, that I teach, that I practice, and, and that I teach is the uh, the Ball of Serato screen system. Right. Uh, beyond that, I have an appreciation for all Filipino all martial arts and more sure. for all martial arts in general. And it just uh, it, it's uh, it, it's a wonderful experience for me because I have an opportunity to speak to uh, to speak to the uh, most influential. Uh, or some of the most influential martial artists, instructors, uh, authors uh, in the uh, in the industry today, and uh, it, it's uh, an opportunity for me to share that experience with not only my students uh, but uh, those who happen to uh, come upon it and, and care to listen. So uh, it's um, it's indeed a, a pleasure again to speak with you. And uh, again, I hope that uh, hope that you know, sometime in the near future well hopefully I'll see you in um, in Ohio if, when you come out for Anthony Davis's uh, headquarter opening absolutely and I'll, I, and I'll come out I, and uh, exactly. and see you all there so are you planning to be there I, I, I am I'm Excellent. invited this evening and uh, it's it's a six or seven hour drive and I'd be happy to make it outstanding outstanding so uh, Mr. We'll Wiley again that. it's been a pleasure look forward to seeing you at that time Thank you, Michael. I appreciate your effort and time and this opportunity. Take care. You have a great evening. Thank you.